Well, ladies and gentlemen, a very warm welcome this evening to uh, the state of chronic emergency, breaking the cycle of endemic war in Gaza. A conversation with Dr. Ghassan Abu Sitta. I'm Richard Sullivan from King's College London, and I'll be your host this evening to have a conversation with Ghassan. Well, the war this May in Gaza saw yet again an astonishing loss of life and destruction. Whilst I think most scholars see today's war along an axis that began with the split between the West Bank and Gaza in 2006, the reality is the route stretched back to the Nakba, the Palestinian cataclysm in 1948 that saw the permanent displacement of the majority of the Palestinian nation. Now, it's been estimated that some 250,000 Palestinians have been injured or killed in Gaza since the beginning of the First Intifada in 1988. Over the last 13 years, Gaza has endured four wars, numerous air raids and incursions, and repeated uh, violations of international law. Well, this webinar is going to discuss the challenges facing the humanitarian sector between continuously responding to the exigencies of recurrent emergencies and trying to build the capacities in a system that is distorted by the complexity of war injuries. Now, the practical imperative of requiring access to Gaza through Israeli controlled crossings and the moral imperative to advocate against the oppressor bear witness to an illegal siege that have forced the humanitarian sector into a very uneasy silence around the siege of Gaza. Well, tonight I'm here in conversation with Dr. Ghassan Abu Sitta to explore these competing and contradictory priorities based on his first hand account of working in the Palestinian health sector during all of these four wars, and indeed with the humanitarian sector since the first intifada. Um, Ghassan will need no introduction to many of you, but for those of you who haven't met him before, he's an extraordinarily accomplished individual. He's a UK trained uh, reconstructive surgeon. He heads the conflict medicine program at the American University of Beirut Global Health Institute. He's one of the, the co-faculty on the Research for Health in Conflict program that we run jointly together, looking at developing conflicts and health in the Middle East. And he combines extraordinary clinical skills with expertise of a really field leading plastic surgeon with academic and humanitarian interests. He's been at the front line of many conflicts over the years in places that are diverse and not just in Palestine, but in Iraq, Syria and Southern Lebanon. And his own personal research interests, um, he's very interested in the biosocial consequences and psychological manifestations of wounding and trauma and LMICs. And he's actually published an extraordinarily fabulous book, which I thoroughly recommend to everybody, called Reconstructing the War Injured Patient. And I know he has a forthcoming book as well called Treating the War Injured Child, again, both by Springer. He's featured numerous times in the media over the last few years and of course has a fantastic track record both in the RCUK MENA program as well as working with the chair of the crew with the Swiss Cross Foundation and he serves on many international boards including the National Institute for Health Research and also the Global Health Research Group on burn traumas um, which I believe is through the Blast Injury Studies Centre at Imperial College. Ghassan, you're hugely welcome. Absolutely delighted to be here in conversation. <coughs> um, let me start this evening, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to have, first of all, you know, maybe 20 to 30 minutes discussion. Then we're going to please send in all your questions because something we want to do is pick up people's thoughts and, and reflections as we have a conversation. Ghassan, before we sort of plunge into your experiences in, in the recent war, let me begin the, the conversation this evening, perhaps by starting by asking you to give you some context to your life and work. Why did you get involved in this from the beginning? Give people some interest and some insight into this. Um, first of all, thank you very much, Richard, for, um, for your kindness and for taking the time um, to, for us to have this conversation, which I think is, is very timely. I, uh, um, as a, a, a Palestinian, um, uh, was, you know, and the child of, of Palestinian refugees uh, became aware of life and politics within the prism of the displacement of my family in 1948. And then the war in Lebanon uh, became, you know, earliest or, or one, one of the kind of uh, pivotal um, moments in my life was the summer of 82 when the Israelis invaded Lebanon and the siege of Beirut. Uh, 
And therefore, as a, uh, um, as a, a Palestinian studying medicine, the two uh, were always going to be inexorably uh, uh, connected. Um, my first experience during the first Intifada was soon followed by uh, working in Iraq after the first American war in Iraq. And so there were two areas that I became interested in. One was the issue of Palestine and the, and the relationship between health and the conflict in Palestine, but also understanding uh, uh, the relationship between war and, and, and health on a broader scale and looking at the whole region. And therefore, as my career progressed and I had the opportunity to also develop an academic interest, it was natural that these experiences would start reflecting themselves in this, uh, in this field. Um, uh, uh, the most critical component uh, was the realization that in the Arab world, these injuries can be classified as an endemic disease. This is not to depoliticize or ahistoricize war, but to say that, 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 that war injuries in a limited geographic area over a prolonged period of time, effectively uh, uh, that adversely affect people's health effectively constitute an endemic disease. And it's critical that we uh, uh, who are interested in health in the region and in Palestine understand this. But the other thing is, what is interesting is that in the Arab world, and, and it's something that's unique from other areas in the South, that the concept of health was, and the provision of health was critical to the post-colonial era. And therefore you could see it in the post-colonial states in the Arab world and in the discourse of the Palestinian liberation movement that placed health as a critical component of popular mobilization and legitimacy of political elites. And therefore health occupied, early on I realized that occupied a very unique position within the kind of politics as a broad sense in, in the region. It's very unusual for a clinician, and if I may be so bold to say a surgeon, to take wider historical interests, and, and your work has been seminal in, the, in biosociology in this particular area. How did you manage, I, I guess the wider question for me before we come to the war again is, how did you manage to educate yourself and to have both a sort of instrumental education as a reconstructive surgeon, the experience of being a surgeon in conflict, but also to understand you know, this wider sociological literature. How did you approach that latter, that last bit? It probably, as a coping mechanism, you need to be able to understand the big picture, to cope with the horrors of the day-to-day -day clinical manifestations of these wars. Uh, and therefore, the, 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 uh, the need to see what, manifests itself in terms of the physical wounding as part of a big picture that has historical and social roots really was and, and remains a, a big incentive to understanding how these uh, the relationship between this wounding as a clinical manifestation and the and the broader sense and also just being very lucky with with collaborating with colleagues who have been you know, in a kind of multidisciplinary uh, uh, projects that have been extremely generous with their time uh, in guiding me to kind of be able to, to fill in the gaps, as you pointed out, in, in my education about understanding the anthropological, the sociological and the historical uh, uh, um, roots of what we saw in the operating room. Let me can maybe pick up on what you just said there around the coping mechanism, maybe give our listeners some sense of just how much experience you've had, because I think there's, there's always this, this tendency to reduce experience to numbers. And I wonder if you could just maybe explore with a bit of narrative, maybe your first, your first exposure to conflict medicine and war surgery. And, and give us a sense of just the amount of breadth and depth over the years. I mentioned a little bit about Iraq. You mentioned Palestine, obviously, as well. 
give us some sense of just what you've seen and done over the years, Gassan. So um, it was the, 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 um, the first intifada. Uh, health was, was very quickly seen as one of the mobilizing uh, 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 issues around which grassroots uh, organizations could be set up that serve the Palestinian population in Gaza and the West Bank. And as the Israeli policy of intentional wounding, uh, which was referred to by, uh, by Rabin as breaking their bones, uh, became more uh, obvious. I uh, went as a medical student to Gaza to volunteer with what in, had just been set up as the Health Workers Committee. Uh, and then in the West Bank uh, uh, um, uh, in the second half of that summer. Um, then came the war on Iraq and I was part of the Harvard study team that went to Iraq at the end of the first war and we looked at uh, infant mortality and nutritional status of the Iraqi population following what was then seen as the first clinical precise war in which these laser guided bombs were not killing people but were just purely destroying the infrastructure of the sewage and water treatment and the electricity and what we were able to show that actually these are the junctures of modern life and if dismantled will lead to widespread uh, increases in mortality. And then I was fortunate uh, to work in South Lebanon with an amazing uh, um, uh, Scottish pediatrician, Runa Mackay, who's no longer uh, with us, who had been in Palestine since 49 and has worked with Medical Aid for Palestinians uh, repeatedly. And she took me under her wing as a medical student uh, uh, in the, um, she ran a mobile health clinic in the uh, villages that were right next to the self Israeli self-declared uh, security zone in, in South Lebanon. And after that, uh, uh, you know, the more I progressed within my clinical training, uh, the more I became involved in different aspects. So I took six months off when the, the first, the second intifada happened, and I was a, a junior registrar between having completed my uh, uh, surg you know, early surgical training and then applying for higher surgical training. And I took six months and worked in, in, in Jabalia camp in Lauda hospital, which I still return to. Uh, and at that time, the, 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 the northern part, which were Jabalia was, was witness to kind of almost weekly Israeli incursions because they weren't met with any kind of meaningful resistance. And therefore there were lots of injuries. And that's when I started to understand really the need to systemize our understanding of, of uh, uh, um, war injuries and the problems that we were facing as Palestinians where we are continuously unable to convert our experiences as clinicians to expertise because we didn't have the systems and we didn't have the institutions that are required in medicine to convert experience into expertise. And therefore, with every new battle, we were almost witnessing a re-emergence re of the same challenges. Then uh, towards the end of my training, when I was doing my fellowship in 2008, 2009, there was that war and the massive use of phosphorus bombs by the Israelis. And I was uh, uh, fortunate to be able to go with my mentor, uh, 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 Dr. Sui Yang, to Gaza. To step back, um, I think a year after I came back from Gaza during the, first uh, the second Intifada, uh, there was the London Underground bombings. And I was working in the Royal London Hospital, which had received 200 of the wounded in the London Underground bombings. So there was a kind of different exposure to that kind of wounding within so similar uh, ordinance but different uh, uh, um, different health settings and then the 2008 war in 2011 i moved to lebanon that's when i was able to kind of start looking academically at this issue because the american university in beirut was seeing patients from iraq and then later on from syria wounded by the wars there and we were able to set up the first 
multidisciplinary war injuries clinic, uh, and then later on a pediatric war injuries program uh, for uh, children mainly from the Syrian war. And then you had the 2012 war in Gaza, the long war of 2014, which was a devastating 50 day war that I was able to kind of go from my work in Lebanon uh, and work in, in Shifa hospital during that time. Uh, and then uh, the devastation and which was a completely different form of what were the great marches of return. So th as you know, Richard, the great marches of return were demonstrations by Palestinian refugees and their descendants at the uh, 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 area separating Gaza from the 48 armistice line. Yes. Uh, uh, that happened most Fridays over a two year period. And over that two year period, uh, Israeli uh, army snipers shot and wounded 8,000 of these demonstrators with high velocity gunshot wounds. 80% of this, these 8,000 were uh, um, uh, in the lower limbs, mm -hmm. uh, uh, leaving a lot of these uh, uh, wounded uh, demonstrators with severe and highly complex uh, injuries. Mm -hmm. And it was that, my experience there uh, on during that time, especially around the time when the American embassy was moved to Jerusalem, that I started to kind of try to understand the relationship that differentiates settler colonialism and war injuries under settler colonialism with other forms of repression. Particularly this idea that I believe that in settler colonialism, what differentiates it from any other form of occupation uh, is that it's the body of the native that is the battleground because subjugating the native uh, uh, is critical uh, a, a critical component to the success of, of the, the settler colonial project. And therefore what we saw in the great marches of return, that uh, ritualistic mutilation every uh, 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 Friday was almost akin to what we saw in Sierra Leone by the RUF, where people had their arms and limbs amputated as a kind of marker, as a biological marker of the supremacy of, of the the uh, 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 the opposing force and almost like what well, you know that kind of historically what King Leopold of Belgium had done in Zaire uh, in also amputating the 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 limbs of the natives almost that 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 the natives body had to be marked by this relationship um, and then after the great marches of return there came this war and this war you could see it kind of almost developing differently in that it was developing as a result of complexities of the internal Israeli politics, but that was the trigger. But as the Israeli uh, um, uh, military leaders have always said, uh, um, you know, they would refer to these cyclical wars, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, cyclical wars as uh, mowing the lawn. And so there was a need to go back to Gaza this May and mow the lawn again. Yeah, so this is classic counterinsurgency warfare doctrine. And I guess you, you brought us wonderfully, if that's the right word, up to date to talk about, you know, your experiences in, in the latest war. Maybe first of all, just give, you, give people a sense of how you came to be in Gaza this time, exactly what the process it was and how you ended up there. And then give us a sense of what you saw when you got there. So um, as, as the, the, so the critical difference uh, is the issue of Sheikh Jarrah. So one would ask uh, why is the neighborhood of Sheikh Jarrah and the Israeli plans to completely uh, uh, ethnically cleanse this area different from the kind of daily house demolitions and exclusion of Palestinians from Jerusalem. And I think the critical point is that the Israeli side is so emboldened by Western support that it felt sufficiently emboldened to move towards collective 
uh, expulsion of Palestinians, i.e. that this was not a house there and a house here, but actually that they would move towards clearing whole neighborhoods. And for Palestinians, this was reminiscent of uh, 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 effectively the Nakba and then the early 50s where Palestinians were driven en masse by the Israeli uh, uh, forces. And therefore, I had kind of had a, a feeling that somehow that this could not pass. And that because Netanyahu was so worried about ending up in prison, if he did not become prime minister, I knew that he was going to continuously push uh, through his allies in the settler movement until there was a trigger for a new war. And so I just made my way uh, to Egypt and then went through Rafah, uh, um, you know, uh, the first opportunity I had. And, and under what auspices do you, do you, do you get through Rafah into Gaza? With I an went in as a, as, a, as a civilian. As a civilian. But I was, I, with the plan to, to, to basically, uh, uh, once I was in Gaza, to work in a limb reconstruction unit that was run by MSF. Okay, so you made your way to that limb reconstruction. Give, give people a sense of where that is and what you saw when you, you arrived. So, um, uh, just to kind of say that this, in, during this war, and one of the reasons why I felt uh, this was critical, the Israelis did not allow any humanitarian teams into Gaza. So ICRC and the full uh, MSF team and NORWAC, the Norwegian aid agency, could not get their teams into Gaza. They were stopped. Even, you know, even Western press were not allowed into Gaza. The, so the limb reconstruction uh, unit had been set up by MSF in collaboration with uh, the uh, Union of Healthware Committees in Lauda Hospital, which is in Jabalia camp in the northern part of Gaza, to respond to this epidemic of gunshot wounds to the limb that happened during the great marches of return and the need to provide a specialist unit, an orthoplastic unit, which means a, a unit that, that is manned by both orthopedic and plastic surgeons and a full team that do complex limb reconstruction uh, as a result of the sheer numbers of uh, wounded during the great marches of return that needed complex rim reconstruction. And just to give you an idea, these patients who are shot by these high velocity uh, 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 bullets uh, to their uh, lower limbs need on average 12 to 15 surgeries by the time they are able to say that whatever disability minimizing surgery has taken place and they are left with the final disability, uh, either a shortened limb or a shortened limb with a nerve injury. So uh, that was set up and had been working through the last three years leading up to the war. And I had been involved with MSF in setting it up uh, uh, um, and looking at, you know, part of the work that we did with the researchers look at the outcomes of these, these specialist units. And so um, that was the aim. Now, once we, I got to, 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 to Gaza, uh, uh, we, you know, as is always the case, you make yourself available to the Ministry of Health and they decide where they, the, the need is the most. And so the decision was that whatever cases were in Shifa Hospital, which is the main tertiary hospital, that were in intensive care and therefore could not be safely transferred. Uh, I would operate on them there. And then whatever we could isolated limb injuries that would be taken to the limb reconstruction unit in order to free up beds for more wounded to come to, to Shifa, that would be done. So, so we were, I was shuttling between the two uh, uh, places um, and, and by and large, all of the wounded were identical. So each of the wars has a kind of signature wounding mechanism, which kind of gives you an idea of what the aims of the war are. So the 2008-2009 war, the signature uh, injury was phosphorus burns, because so much of phosphorus burns had been, so much phosphorus bombs had been used, tank delivered, air delivered. Uh, uh, in the 2014 war, 
it was shrapnel injuries from targeting uh, the rural uh, areas in Gaza and areas in the periphery of Gaza. And in this war, uh, the majority of injuries were crush injuries. And so basically people who had, all of the wounded had been targeted in their homes and all of their injuries related to their homes collapsing on top of them and crushing their limbs uh, and devastating soft tissues and bones. And because they were being targeted in the homes, the demographic distribution of the wounded and the killed reflected that of society. And therefore that's why we had 30 to 40% of the wounded as children. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you made a very good point here. Maybe I'll just maybe focus on a little bit more because for people listening, to understand the nature of you saying of the way that things were attacked this one the deep penetrating munitions the i mean give people a sense for what you saw from an infrastructure destruction perspective because i said as you saying it was it was qualitatively very different with the with the with the with the ground penetrating munitions that were used this time so give you obviously saw quite a lot in terms of damage give everybody a sense for what you saw in terms of the damage that had been so, so the areas in, in the Gaza Strip that had been targeted the most this time were the urban areas in the center of Gaza City, which as a result of the pressures on land, Gaza being so small with such a high population density, had basically developed these high-rise buildings. In addition, uh, uh, one of the kind of manifestations of the shortage of land in Gaza is that families would basically live in the same building. And so, you know, the grandparents would buy the land, but they would build so that each of the children was able to build their apartment. Mm. And so what we would see is that the whole extended family would either be completely wiped off, which is what happened to 10 Palestinian families. And so there's a kind of term in Gaza that developed in 2014 saying, wiped off the, the civil register. And that's when there's no lineage left of that family from the grandparents to the grandchildren, or that the whole family was wounded together or a combination of you know, wounding and killing of whole families. Where by whole families, I'm saying the grandparents, the married children, their children, the great grandchildren would be all wounded in the same place. And so you had these high rise buildings that were completely being devastated, but the ordinance was of such high uh, uh, tonnage that there is a radius of four or five buildings around each of these buildings that would also be either rendered completely unusable or severely damaged. But the flying debris would also constitute part of the wounding mechanism. Yeah, and I think that's important to talk about because we have a situation here, which I'm sure we're going to come on to, talking about the public health priorities going forward. I guess I'd like to slightly shift gear, if I may, and, and take you on from your experience to perhaps, you know, let's, let's talk a little bit about what does this mean for preparing for the forever emergency? Can you give everyone a sense for what you mean and how you interpret the forever emergency in Gaza? So if we think about the public health uh, uh, pyramid where you need the base, large number of primary care providers, and then you move towards the apex as you get more specialized. The complexity of war injuries means that Gaza's medical needs are this pyramid sitting on its head. And so when you have, uh, when you have 300, 400 open complex uh, limb injuries with loss of tissue, loss of soft tissue, vascular injuries, nerve injuries, and crushed pulverized bone. Such a sheer number, or 8,000 shot in the limbs over two years. It means that your requirements of orthopedic surgeons and within orthopedic surgery, limb salvage surgeons, your requirements of vascular surgeons who are able to take these patients to the operating room within the limit of not exsanguinating or losing the limb, your requirement of intensive care beds, of plastic surgeons, of general surgeons, far outweighs that of a normal uh, 
two million population. So when you think about it, four million, each of London's four trauma centers has a, a, has a, um, a catchment area of four million. But the, the, you know, the Royal London Hospital or King's or George's or St. Mary's cannot cope with, uh, 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 you know, four million in a situation like Gaza, uh, where you have this, these complete upheavals where vascular surgeons literally have to be doing 50, 60 repairs in one night because that's the nature of the injuries. And so that is the distortion is how can, you, how can you prepare such a, a health system while you, th that health system is living under siege, under the most brutal siege, which not only makes sure that, that you know, a, a, a Gaza's health system is just above collapse, but also that the economic situation is devastating. So the pressures on these highly skilled professionals to emigrate is high, uh, 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 that uh, the economic collapse means that they haven't been, don't get paid for six months and 12 months on end. So all of these pressures, the siege and the wars that are a component of the siege, uh, 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 in addition to the types of injuries these wars create, completely have completely distorted Gaza's health needs. Uh, and, and all what we can see in terms of the, the, the humanitarian sector trying to, to respond is respond to this mutilation, this distortion. So medical aid for Palestinians uh, uh, sends uh, limb salvage surgeons from two major limb salvage units in Gaza, uh, in, in London, to basically train uh, 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 the limb salvage team in Gaza and to also ho help decrease the load, which is unmanageable for them. So suddenly you're not only required to provide extra orthopedic surgeons and plastic surgeons, but actually subspecialist orthopedic and plastic surgeons that are few and far between in their home countries, let alone in a place like Gaza. And the same for intensive care beds. And, and then you, and on top of that, you weaponize everything else. So you weaponize the infrastructure by completely destroying it and creating an environmental catastrophe. And so we know that the, you know, the majority of war wounds infected in Gaza, 90% will have multi-drug resistant bacteria. That we know that, that the water, uh, and sewage uh, 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 infrastructure in Gaza uh, is basically been destroyed either through wars or a combination of the siege that prevents the infrastructure being rebuilt, which means that the water uh, 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 it becomes unusable or requires such treatment that it decreases the shelf life of the majority of uh, medical equipment. And so that whole crucible that is Gaza uh, 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 becomes a kind of, you know, almost like a firestorm uh, that, that everything within it aims at uh, uh, denuding the quality and the, and the, uh, uh, um, and the uh, uh, livability of Palestinian lives. Mm. You add to that then the, co the COVID uh, 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 pandemic and you get a catastrophe and we're now watching that catastrophe unfold in Gaza in that you know not only so if you look at the history of COVID in Gaza first the Israelis refused to allow the PCR tests to go in in meaningful numbers to allow a kind of logical monitoring and then said that that they weren't obliged under international law which they are to provide uh, uh, for the health needs of the Palestinian population. And then they prevented the, the, COVID, the uh, vaccines reaching Gaza through Eretz. And then now in the last few days, there is this major uh, 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 scandal where the Israelis had pressurized the Palestine Authority to accept 100,000 doses of vaccine that was expiring in June. Yeah. Not just that, 
it also turns out that one of the conditions of taking these almost expired vaccines that none, the PA does not send any of them to Gaza. So the decision to also deny Gaza these vaccines so that all of this catastrophe, because we know that during this war, uh, uh, around 15,000 people ended up internally displaced and living in UN schools. And so there's, you know, the, that whole uh, 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 COVID brewing, next wave brewing, uh, means that there was a need for a very quick vaccina vaccination program, but that's that's not going to happen. So you, you've gone on to in, moved on to public health that we would like to discuss. I think discuss a little bit more about. Before I go on to that, I guess let me st stick on the forever emergency and just kind of reflect. Sui Ang has just asked, well, made a comment actually that, of course, the catastrophe is totally man-made, and by implication can be unmade by man or woman. I should add, um, how. How can we do this? I, I guess it comes down to this problem of the forever emergency without a political solution for Palestine. I mean, what you're saying here is they're, they're, these two things are inextricably linked. Is that fair to say? What, what, it's more than that. It, that that the, 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 for the emergency is one of the weapons of subjugation. The siege and the cyclical wars are part of this titration experiment by which you basically effectively hold a, a, a waterboard the population to within seconds of exsanguinating and then you let them breathe and then you waterboard them again and then you let them breathe and so the the, the siege and the wars not only are a consequence of the the political situation no they are actually a weapon of the political situation so so that in itself the the catastrophization of palestinian life uh, uh, is a, a a policy rather than a consequence of the chaos of war so where where does the humanitarian sector writ large here and you may want to dissect this out a bit more but i'm anwar MSF, ICRC, where do they sit in all of this, both in terms of, you know, within the forever emergency, but any idea of exiting from the forever emergency? What, what, is, what is their role? So the, the problem is, and, and, and you know, I'm speaking as someone who, who, who is part of this humanitarian response, is that you know that you are part of that titration equation that you know the kind of two pipettes of life and death that titrate the siege to the point where life is not worth living but you're not totally dead as a humanitarian sector we are part of that uh, experiment and that's when we get, you know that's when the israelis hold off allowing uh, 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 humanitarian teams in and then let them in during the 2014 war and, you, you know, even those who are within the humanitarian sector completely aware of this, there is a sense that you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. You cannot turn around and say, I am not going to provide for this population because I believe that, you know, I am be, being used as part of the siege. That's within the humanitarian sector. But the, the issue is not just with the humanitarian sector. The issue is that there is an intrinsic logic within humanitarianism or modern humanitarianism to completely depoliticize and dehistoricize. And therefore, when we, and this is part of the aim of the siege, so that we completely, and cr the creation of the catastrophe is that we completely talk about Gaza in terms of medication and health and and electricity and diesel and calories uh, and and we don't talk about talk about gaza in terms of you know the settler colonialism and the right of return of the palestinians living there and the right to self determination of palestinians and so the siege and the creation of a humanitarian catastrophe ensures that that we are all sucked into that discourse those who are willing those who are not willing, those who are aware, and those who are unaware are sucked into that logic because the, this is a population that's held hostage uh, 
and you are told you want to go in and help them, you can. If you don't want to go and help them, then it's, it's on your head. Uh, and that becomes the, the kind of conversion, almost the conversion of Gaza from the political to the humanitarian. And that's what the siege aims to do. That's why you need to create a humanitarian catastrophe in Gaza, so that the discourse remains about the, the, the humanitarian need, which are pressing, but also remains about the emergency. So you don't talk about the law. So, so I mean, you, you and I have, 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 you know, long, and you've done a lot of work on issues of cancer in Gaza. And we've had these conversations, you know, there are other health needs in Gaza, but these health needs, one are weaponized as part of the same siege, the denial of exit of, of cancer patients, the denial of entrance of radiotherapy equipment, the, 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 you know, the whole siege has completely denuded the ability of Gaza to provide for its patients with cancer. But at the same time, uh, we, 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 you know, you know, whenever there's funding, funding comes with the war and the, and the funding goes to the emergency. And so whatever, even if there is a will, it, there never is that money to look at Gaza's other health needs because there's that black hole that will suck in everything which are these war wounds that require all of these uh, um, all of these uh, um, uh, uh, all of this aid so this is you you're, you're getting into areas now of necro power and late modern colonial occupation essentially and, and i guess what i maybe would like to do is just explore this a little bit more because you know, perhaps it's been sort of well articulated that, you know, the colonial state de derives its fundamental claim of sovereignty, legitimacy from its authority over a narrative of history and identity. And you articulated that very well. I guess what seems different here in the forever emergency and particular Gaza is the way that health has been used within it by Israeli in, in a sense of keeping the emergency as only an emergency and never allowing a health system to emerge because that gives the right of state if you allow a health system to emerge. I guess, and well, I do want to push you on this a little bit, the humanitarian sector, is it complicit in some way in, in allowing a forever emergency? Do you think its voice is loud enough in saying that there must be transition to state system? You see, there are times when you say to yourself, you know, it is complicit, it vo its voice needs to be louder. But you and I know that when that application goes to the military coordinator at Erez, and that particular humanitarian organization had just put out a press release saying that, you know, the, the denial of access of, of cancer patients outside Gaza for treatment or the targeting of civilians, then they get denied their permits or their permits get kicked for 50, 60 days before they, they hear back from these permits. And suddenly, uh, um, not only do these humanitarian organizations are faced with the sense that, you know, we've made the stand, but, you know, that we have been, you know, our, our beneficiaries have been denied as a result of the fact that we have done the right thing and we have pushed for the root causes of this humanitarian catastrophe to be uh, reversed. Uh, 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 the the you know the um, uh, uh, the their beneficiaries have 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 suffered. So if you're not allowed in, you're not allowed in, and that goes to the to the to the root of the problem. The problem isn't the humanitarian humanitarianism. The root is the impunity, the impunity of the Israeli government in dealing with the humanitarian sector like this and dealing with the palestinians like this that and and it's the impunity so if you look at the at the wars uh, in gaza each war there was a small experiment in which we had a microcosm of the worst aspect of the war after and whenever that microcosm or that experiment went without uh, 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 repercussions, then the war happened. So at the end of 2014, at the very end, a few days before the ceasefire, the Israelis basically leveled a 14-story uh, tower block. 
and because nothing was done about it, and because that sense of impunity was strengthened, this war was all about leveling tower blocks. Uh, 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 in 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 uh, uh, in um, 2009, there were experiments using dime, using fletchet bombs, you know, and and then in 2014 they were widespread in their use, and so it's the driver here is impunity and the and the impunity is given to the israeli governments by uh, western governments and the system that exists within western societies that one silences palestinian voices and two uh, uh, has created a mechanism a punitive mechanism for silencing those who stand up to the palestinians you know and and so uh, uh, um, that impunity is the driver of this uh, atrocity, the previous atrocities, and the coming atrocities. Yeah. So, I, I just just a couple of comments in the, in the comment box that you know from Fouad sieges a weapon against people's healthcare. Well said, Hassan and and Gianu saying the emergency humanitarian programs will never solve problems of socio economic development development programs. Um, will never solve political problems. Humanitarian workers are ill-equipped to deal with the politics apart from advocacy. I, I guess maybe in the sort of, in our, in our final gear as we shift again, standing back a little bit here from, from you know, the Gaza and what, what's this going to mean for the distortion of public health priorities? And maybe give us a sense as well of where you think, what do you think is going to happen over the next few years? Are we going to simply see one, upon another incursion attacks until what i mean where does the forever end, emergency end in gaza so i think it was in 2018 2017 the un produced a report mm. that said that in 2000 uh, in 2020 gaza will no longer be habitable right and that was based on the quality of water on a, a multitude of environmental factors and it caused a shock, and the situation today is much worse than 2020. Mm. Um, it is that, uh, uh, again, we go back to the issue is, is that unless that impunity is, you know, unless there's an end to the sense of impunity, then you cannot begin to reverse uh, these policies that continuously uh, 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 violate Palestinian life and violate Palestinian health and deem Palestinian lives to be uh, 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 a, a, a worthy of being denuded by a siege. I mean, if you're a 14-year-old child in Gaza, you've already lived through four wars. I mean, that's how horrendous uh, uh, life in the last, uh, 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 you know, since the siege started. You probably have never left uh, Gaza, you mm. probably have never, uh, uh, um, you know, you've you've you know the the seventy percent unemployment, the the quality of the water, the the three hours of electricity per day, all of these things have now been the lives of a whole generation in Gaza. I have some questions for you to follow up on this, in a sense, from this is from Emily. How clinical care for war wounds intersect with the livelihood provision? And I guess it just sort of speaks to that 14 year old boy now of from experience wounded young men with limited employment opportunities trapped in a cycle of, of um, provided for family and health and well being. Give us a sense of how that is broken because that's in a sense the kind of development intersection almost with, with the experience of these individuals. So, uh, with regards to the children, um, with each of the wars, I can tell you that stunted growth has become much worse. And stunted growth uh, is the, a chronic uh, long-term uh, malnutrition. And clinically, it manifests itself for a simple surgeon like myself and yourself, is when you look at a child and you can't tell their age because they have the body of a nine-year-old, but in fact, they're 12 or they're 14 because their stature and their uh, 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 weight and their height are all small. This has, and, and, and when you're giving medication to children 
you need, this is one of the ways you kind of calculate the dose. So suddenly, you, you, so you look out for these things when you're taking a patient to, to the operating room, how much local anesthetic you can use based on the age, but you look at the body and the body doesn't co correlate with the age. And so chronic malnutrition is getting worse and worse. Stunted growth amongst Palestinian children is getting worse and worse, which means that these crushed bones will take longer to heal and their outcome will be worse and these wounds will be worse. The other thing that I noticed this year is that in 2008 and in 2014, you used to ask the adult patients, especially the males, have, you know, what did you work? And they told you that, you know, I was so, such and such, but I've been unemployed for the last couple of years. Now you're getting people and you ask them and they've never worked. They have, you know, there are 20 year olds in Gaza and 30 year olds in Gaza who have, as a result of the siege, never known employment beyond these, you know, kind of employment generation, six months every two years projects that the UN runs where you kind of go around sweeping the streets so you can collect a, a salary. So uh, uh, the socioeconomic is, is very present in these, uh, uh, in these patients all around you. Uh, in addition, you know, it's the kind of basics. When we now look at a project for wounded, for war wounded, we now look at the project and say, actually, if we do not provide transport, for the patient to come from the house to the hospital and back. People do not have that cash to, 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 to get transport, to get a cab or to get a, a rent a car to, to, to come. And so all of these distortions create, uh, 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 um, uh, create a, 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 a situation where, you know, the, the unemployment in addition to the wounding, in addition to the uh, disability, all coalesce into creating a denuded life. You, I mean, this picks up a, a question from Dina Aina about the ethical dilemmas of complacency that you have discussed. And I, I guess this question of you have witnessed and recounted at first hand the atrocities you've seen, the destruction you've seen, and to uh, as a very credible source. Yet some people may stand back and say, well, what, what's changed? How this has changed the narrative? What, what's altered? And I guess this is this question of the advocacy here and, and tying into one of, the, you know, one of the final questions about, do you believe there is a solution here? And I guess what, what is the role of the healthcare in the solution? Is it to hang on until political settlement is, is achieved? Well, I mean, what I'm trying to get is what, what do you think your role is in, within the healthcare sector here? I mean, I, I come from the, the pre-resilience uh, generation. You know, I believe in steadfastness and not resilience. And I believe, and what, what, what took me to medicine is that uh, as a Palestinian is, is the, the, the sense that health, uh, which was a critical component of uh, the Palestinian liberation uh, 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 concept was a critical component of steadfastness, i.e. the ability to uh, persist in the face of aggression rather than resist uh, resilience, which is the kind of liberal public health concept, which is the ability to get a kick in and still be ready to, to, get, to get another kicking. Um, uh, and so it's that that is the idea. The idea is unless the, the support for health is linked to solidarity, uh, 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 then it becomes pointless or short-lived or temporary humanitarianism. Both have to go hand in hand. Attempts to, uh, to, to uh, 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 lift the siege on Gaza, stop these wars on Gaza, go hand in hand uh, with attempts to uh, uh, um, improve the healthcare and its ability to provide for people and to stand side by side with the health, Palestinian health professionals who take the, the brunt of these. I mean, you know, best case scenario, you're going to get 30 uh, humanitarian uh, 
health professionals, but it's really the Palestinian health professionals in the hospitals on, in Gaza who have been doing this and doing this under amazing circumstances. I'm, I mean, I'm always shocked how in the midst of all of these wars, they have the ability to leave their families behind and come into work, not knowing if they have families to go back to. I mean, I remember during the 2014 war, uh, uh, one of uh, the least statistics that I was working with, his brother and his whole family were killed and he found out in the middle of our operating list. This time round, when I came in to, to Shifa, one of the, my plastic surgery colleagues came in just to say hello and apologize because he had to go and bury his cousin who had been killed that night in one of the air raids. And so it's solidarity with the Palestinian health uh, system is solidarity with the Palestinian health workers. All projects have to be able to be geared towards supporting them uh, uh, in their work. Uh, either through supporting their, uh, improve, increasing their ability to achieve the natural growth in skills that they're being denied by the siege, or in alleviating the distortions that we talked about. That, you know, if you have a department of orthopedics and the workload of 10 departments of orthopedics, your role as a humanitarian uh, uh, organization is to help them share that load. No, that's right. And I think answers a lot of what I'll come back to Rania Mansour in a moment. I, I want to be slightly within this also the conversation being sort of maybe grounded in the reality of practice here and, and just to pull together two questions really from Emily McMullen and also from Craig as well from Newcastle University. Um, both of them asking really essentially the same thing, which is about the long term rehabilitation and the training of the MDMs to deal with long-term rehabilitation of those who have been wounded. And I guess particularly at this time in terms of the crush injuries, looking down the line, give us a sense at the moment it, 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 with rehabilitation services and, and whether they, as you say, the emergency is the acute, but what happens when you have individuals with life-changing limb damage, life-changing body damages, traumatic brain injury, what sort of sense of rehabilitation services and training is there in Gaza? So the, the problem is that the, this is part of the, this is part of, of the trauma pathway that is almost neglected and always neglected because all of the money is in the duration of the war. Uh, and so uh, 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 there is an insufficient number of rehabilitation uh, uh, health workers, whether they're physiotherapists, occupational therapists, or physicians, to deal with the sheer number. Mm -hmm. There are two uh, centers that deal with lower limb prosthetics because of the sheer number of prosthetics. One does the upper um, above the knee, one does the low knee amputations and children. So there is a, a, a need, it, technically, there is a need within those organizations working in a trauma care to basically uh, continue support or, or to, to concentrate on uh, completing the trauma pathway in, in Gaza towards uh, building uh, a, a rehabilitation component of the trauma pathway. Then there's the devastating realization that the f statistically, you, your chances of getting re-wounded in Gaza increase. I mean, I keep seeing more and more patients with every visit for whom, you know, this was not the first injury. I mean, I remember during the great marches of return, seeing a guy who'd been shot in the left leg and the right leg had been wounded in the 2014 war with an open tibial fracture. So he literally had just had a few months before his external fixators taken off for the right leg. And he came in with a gunshot wound to the left leg. And there are others. And then, you, you know, the issue of the mental health catastrophe. Uh, uh, um, you know, a lot of these kids were wounded in their homes. They had seen their parents wounded, all of it. And, and a lot of these kids, and if you talk to the, the humanitarian sector with, with mental health programs, they had just started to recover from the 2014 war when this all happened again. And so... Uh, uh, there needs to be a holistic approach to 
these injuries clinically to provide the full range of the treatment and to build the kind of necessary uh, infrastructure to deal with them clinically. I, I would like to maybe just wrap up now, really, Gassan. I mean, we could keep on talking for a long time, but I, I guess to say, you know, to live under sort of late modern occupation seems to be like experiencing a permanent condition of being in pain here. You, you're, you've retained an extraordinary ability, as you say, to cope with what you've seen and to stand back and to use both historical ethnographic approaches, your research, to see solutions down the line. I guess it's this, this question again I want to come back to really is, is we're dealing here with the forever emergency and this, the, the state of chronic emergency and breaking the cycle. What do you think are the key components to break the cycle of this endemic war? Uh, the, the, the solution is, is, a, is a political solution. I mean, at the end of the day, the siege has to be lifted and the wars have to be stopped on Gaza, regardless on whether they are part, this is part of the bigger solution to the Palestinian problem. You know, the, the Palestinian struggle, we need to keep going back to this idea that the wars on Gaza and the siege on Gaza is not a byproduct of a uh, of the the bigger question of the the uh, 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 denial of Palestinian rights. The siege and the wars are weapons being used against Palestinians in Gaza, in addition to the war on the Palestinian people. That's an extremely powerful way to end, actually. Um, Gassan, Gassan Abusita, thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much, Richard. Today. Um, author, humanitarian, as a, you know, as a, I, I would say, an advocate and as a witness to your people. Extraordinary, extraordinary what you have done. Um, we're extremely grateful for you sharing these insights this evening. Very grateful for all our um, attendees as well. It's a marvellous range of questions. I'm sorry I couldn't get to all of them. Uh, I'm sure we're going to have many more of these conversations. But Gassan, thank you very much thank indeed. Thank you. Thank and you very much. And good night and thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Bye-bye.